Okay, so yeah, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Herbert Spong giving a talk at our colloquium. So yeah, just quick introduction. So Herbert is a very accomplished um, mathematical physicist. Uh, he did his PhD in 1975, University of Munich, and uh, he's now at uh, yeah TUM, uh, Technical University of Munich, and he got a lot of prizes. So I just mentioned some of them that you can find also in Wikipedia. So he, he found he had the Denny Heidemann Prize for mathematical physics in 2011. Uh, the Max Planck Medal, 2017, from the German Physical Society. And 2019, the highest prize of statistical physics, the Boltzmann Medal, uh, he obtained. Um, he also was invited at the International Congress for uh, Mathematician 2010, uh, gave an invited talk. And he's written two books on the subjects of uh, large scale dynamics and hydrodynamics and um, uh, many body interacting systems. So, he's, uh, so it's really an honor to have him to uh, give a talk at this colloquium. Uh, I had the, 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 the honor to, to work with him in the past years on the subject of generalized hydrodynamics. And uh, he's done a lot of work on that, especially in the relation with the TODA model. And I uh, leave you to uh, give uh, your talk on this subject. Okay, thank you very much, Benjamin, for this kind introduction. So, um, I mean, you know, what I should do is uh, advertise an exciting subject and, and list many names and uh, uh, you know, give a broad outline. And then I thought it's such a diverse audience and maybe, you know, none of them or very few, I mean, except for Benjamin, of course, who knows every line of my talk, uh, you know, really knows what the whole thing is about. And so maybe I saw the better strategy would be to play, explain you first a little bit, give you some background directly on the classical Toda lattice, which the system exclusively, uh, which I will use exclusively during the talk, and then give you some idea of, of these hydrodynamic equations. I mean, they are actually, you know, true in much greater generality than, than I will tell you. But uh, I think just in order to understand the subject, I think it does make sense to, to limit myself to that very particular case. And so let me start right away with, uh, with the first slide, so to speak, which uh, is the total lattice. I mean, so the total lattice is, um, was sort of uh, invented. I guess it was originally called uh, lattice with exponential interactions, but since Toda invented uh, the lattice, I mean, now it's, everybody calls it the Toda lattice. That's many years back. And uh, sort of the very unusual feature is that we have a strongly interacting system. It is in one dimension, uh, but uh, it happens to be integrable. I will say in a, later on what this exactly means. But uh, at that stage, it just means that, that you have um, um, many, many conservation laws rather than only two or three, like, like for sort of the more common systems, which we know. <laughs> so here I've, I've written down the Hamiltonian. So this is, uh, I do classical mechanics. I mean, so you have, uh, you have uh, position and you have momenta, they carry the label to index J. And here's the interaction, you see the usual kinetic energy. And then you see in the, this exponential interaction. So it's the exponential of the positional differences and I emphasize that, you know, it's not, not the sum over all particles, it's just the sum over nearest neighbor in the sense of, uh, of the lattice. I mean, it's just the interaction between J and J plus one. And so particles are distinguishable if you want so, uh, but uh, there's no constraint on the position. I mean, there's no ordering, right? I mean, this is just the index. I mean, QJ plus one could be much less than QJ. I mean, the, the QJ is always in, in, in R. Okay, now uh, this is a little bit formal because I haven't told you, you know, what some I'm doing and, and there will be boundary conditions as so these things are going to come, but uh, let's just sort of get first sort of the elementary things straight. And then of course I can write down Newton's equation of motion, here they are. And uh, let's say I sum here over all, uh, I have sort of index uh, over all uh, uh, integers. The, the thing which I want to emphasize is that um, uh, once you decide on this form, and of course, when you look in the books, you, you might find three parameters. I mean, there's a decay. I mean, there's an interaction strength, so all this kind of thing. But they all scale out. I mean, so there's no free parameter. If I quantize that model, which is the quantum Toda chain, then uh, I would get H bar as an extra parameter. But here in the classical case, there's no parameter. Okay. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, since, uh, I mean, usually I know that for the Zoom, it's always sort of, you know, a little bit complicated. But, but you know, if there should be sort of Questions in between. I mean, you know, just just uh, sort of make make your you somehow visible or some other way. Anyway, so there's no free parameter. Now, of course, you know, this is not the only only um, uh, integral. I mean, very famous is are, are sort of you know 
PDEs in classical uh, <laughs> nonlinear wave equations. Um, so we have quarter vector de Vries or the Sinch Gordon equation. Uh, I should, I, I omitted this. I mean, here I should put, put the Kalogero Moser models. I mean, these are in other classical systems which are integrable interacting particles. Of course, if you go to the quantum world, you know, there's, there's much, much more activity, in fact, and, and uh, there you have other famous models. I mean, like Lieb Liniger, Delta Bose, gas, maybe Hubbard, been quantized, the Toda, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm just looking, as I said, at the total lattice by itself. Now, there are two ways to look at this equation. I mean, one way sort of which I suggested over here is that you just think naively as particles uh, which are sitting on the real line and they have their uh, velocity and then they are just moving according to situations mm -hmm. of motion. So this picture uh, uh, we like to call Toda fluid because, you know, of course it's not exactly fluid, but, but the motion is sort of in some sense fluid-like. So, so this is a sort of a nice name. Now, the other way is to say, aha, no, look, I mean, this is really a continuum equation which you discretize. So the J is simply, you know, the, the lattice label simply refers to discretization um, of a continuum. And then um, we would say, aha, you know, this is a nonlinear wave equation. And uh, which is of this particular form. Second derivative comes from here. And, you know, the first derivative sort of comes because this is a difference and this one is also a difference. And then you see that you have sort of the standard type of a wave equation, which is somewhat strange nonlinearity. It's just sort of minus of the exponential function. So uh, actually I will use mostly this kind of picture and then this uh, is referred to as the total lattice, okay? Because sort of it's a discrete uh, lattice discretization of a continuum wave equation. All right, now in order to, uh, since I assume that, uh, you know, essentially none of you have sort of, uh, sort of really worked or ever looked at this equation of motion, I thought it might be useful to have a little picture, which I show you here. So this is uh, this numerical solution of, uh, of 16 particles. And you see that uh, this is actually what we call the closed system because, uh, you know, there's a unit cell. So actually particles are moving on a circle. Uh, and uh, now you can see how they move. I mean, you know, it's reasonably complicated. And um, uh, if you would sort of continue, presumably you sort of see some sort of statistical equilibrium, you know, if I do time averages of observables, they wouldn't change anymore. But but this is sort of the way how you should uh, sort of, you know, your mental picture of, of the total fluid. I mean, you see that there are lots of interaction here. I mean, it's, it's not just pair interactions. Of course, here you have a nicely isolated interaction between two particles, but then, then you have this you know, long range of um, sort of particles sort of mixed together. Sorry, okay. can I, can yes? I, I didn't quite understand. So the total lattice is uh, the fact that uh, they start along, uh, you know, integer numbers? Is that? Uh, no, no, is no, that no, 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 no. Ah, sorry. Ah, okay. So no, no. I mean, it's always the same equations of motion. I mean, and it's just sort of two different ways of looking at, at it. I mean, you see, in one case, I plot sort of, I would, if I would do a plot, I would plot the position as a function of the, it for each lattice label, right? I mean, I just think of this sort of like, like, a, like, a, like a lattice field. At each day, you would plot the corresponding position. This is, the, this is the lattice picture. And if I do the fluid, then I have just particles moving on the real line. This is the picture. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, this is the fluid picture. Is that fair enough or is, no, still not completely convinced? Oh, just a second. Uh, just uh, just to understand. So total lattice means that you have a discrete set of particles. Same equations of motion, but two different physical interpretations. The second one is that I have a nonlinear wave equation, which is lattice discretized. I see. Okay. Just like you 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 know, if you take the ordinary wave equation and then you discretize it, then you get the harmonic chain. Well, I see. So uh, the nonlinear wave equation is U is now instead of being uh, being like a discrete set, u is a function. That's right. Yeah. So I just discretize this equation, then then if I discretize this equation, I get this one up here, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one way. This is what we call the total lattice. And another way, it's identical. I, mean, I emphasize, you know, it's not, it's the same mathematics, so to speak, but it's two different mental pictures. And the other one is thinking, you know, as as in this picture where I really have have, have you know I have these trajectories which are moving in the continuum. I mean, it's just like like you know, sixteen particles according to Newton's equation of motion. Is that fair enough? Thanks, yes. Okay. All right. So now, now let, let's first look at something which is sort of uh, um, 
a little bit away from from the hydrodynamics, but but uh, some features I will use later on, and therefore it's sort of uh, you know to have uh, not too fast to start. Let me first look at what people call a scattering situation. I mean, so these are now a fixed number of particles, and you have the open chain. This means you just have uh, n particles on the on 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 the real line, but um, uh, you know they they can sort of sort of just sort of escape to infinity. And now the interaction, of course, you have to be careful how you do the interaction. Of course, here's the kinetic energy. But now you see that I sum here only up to n minus 1. So 1 is interacting with 2, 2 with 3, et cetera, n minus 1 with n, and that's it. And so the last particles can move off to infinity. And then, of course, also the other ones can move off infinity. So if I start with some initial condition where they come together, then there would be some complicated interaction. Eventually, they separate, and then they sort of move like three particles. And so if you want to have sort of a caricature of this uh, situation, I put here three particles, three to one, and then, uh, you know, they do this interaction, and then they sort of come out in the order three to one, and they have definite velocities. Now, uh, you know, if, if they're just hard, hard particles with hard collisions, I mean, that's a trivial thing, but the point is that uh, the Toda lattice uh, will do exactly the same thing, and it's a very beautiful paper by Moser many years back, where he proved that when I look at, at the, the long time asymptotics um, of the of the Toda lattice with this open chain boundary condition, eventually I will see sort of uh, uh, particles just moody, uh, freely moving inwards if I go to minus infinity or moving outwards if I go to plus infinity. Okay, So you reverse the order of momenta. I mean, these are indicated over here. That's sort of more trivial geometrical effect. But the main point is that um, you have to look at the next order of the asymptotic evolution. This is what people call the scattering shift. And so it's just saying that if I'm looking at particles with label J, it will have asymptotically, uh, let's say here I go to minus infinity, will have a linear behavior, but then there will be a shift of order one. And equally, I can look um, at the particle going to plus infinity, then I have to reorder the momenta, but then there will be also shift of order one. And the difference of these two shifts is what is called the two is called the scattering shift. Okay, and here's a picture for one particle, you know, it sort of goes asymptotically, you know, I have here a zero shift, and here I have a certain shift um, just in order to make an ice plot. Okay. Now, the two particle scattering shift for the Toda, you can compute easily. It's just, you know, one particle problem moving in this, in this, uh, uh, in, in this exponential potential. And what you discover is that, of course, it does depend on uh, sort of, I take two particles that depends only on the difference of the two velocities and happens to be the logarithm of the, of the uh, value of the, of, uh, the absolute value of the difference. Okay, so, so the, this thing will reappear. I mean, that, that's a very important fact. And in some sense, it's sort of almost the most important quantity which goes into the hydrodynamic equations. Okay, now, sorry, sorry. What, is, what is special, just one word, what is special about an integrable system is that the scattering shift is actually additive. I mean, just like in this picture, if I want to know how much the shift is three, I have to look at, at, at uh, you know, it's the shift it picks up from one and the, the other shift which picks up from two and the other one which picks up from one. And I then simply add the contribution. So, so the integrability in the scattering picture is encoded by the fact that the scattering shift, you know, this asymptotic behavior is simply additive, just like you would think for, for Half point particles. Okay, now there was some question or? Yes, uh, I'm a bit lost. What is this scattering shift and what, why? So the, sc the scattering shift tells you that, that when I look at the, let's say go to plus infinity, when I look at the, the long time asymptotics, I will see it linearly in time. But yeah. it, it shifted by a constant. So the next order correction will be a constant, and that constant is called the scattering shift. So why does that occur? Hmm? Why is it not? Uh, Zero? Why in time? Well, I mean, no, it, it, then of course there will be higher order corrections, but, 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 but this is sort of the leading order, right? Oh, I understand. And, and, uh, and um, uh, it could be zero, but, but you know, in, but in our case, it happens to be uh, just this logarithm. So if I take two particles, and if, if I take, uh, you know, their absolute, the difference, the absolute value of the difference equal to zero, then there will be no scattering shift. It will follow exactly the asymptotics without any first order correction. All right, so that's fine. So, so now, now we have sort of the scattering, and so, and, but now we want to sort of be, um, uh, want to sort of go towards the hydrodynamic equations. And, and, and so uh, this was sort of just to give you a little bit more of background of what happens dynamically, okay? 
All right, so now, now we do the hydrodynamic equation. So now I'm coming sort of from, from, from the first part of my talk. And, and uh, what we are going to do is actually uh, something which is usually called the Euler scale, you know, just like, like Euler fluid, um, where uh, you have, uh, where you look at the dynamics on a ballistic scale. I mean, so, so, so uh, space and time are of the same order. Okay, and of course we are in, in, in one dimension because our total lattice is in one dimension. And uh, the hydrodynamic equations, they are sort of, I mean, the backbone of these hydrodynamic equations are so-called uh, hyperbolic conservation laws. So when I look at, uh, you know, some uh, field U, which is at that stage a little bit unspecified, then uh, it will satisfy this, this, uh, this PDE, uh, first order in T, first order in X, that's the ballistic feature. And of course, you know, to make it interesting, uh, I mean, if I just put here linear, then it would be just sort of free evolution, but, but uh, you know, there's a current. This current is usually some locally uh, for every x, some nonlinear function of the field. Okay, so that that's a simple hyperbolic conservation law in one dimension. So u is a function of x and t, and it, it's solution of that equation. Okay, and and the way you should think about it is that um, uh, so here I have drawn uh, my x, and here I have the u at some particular time. And I'm looking at this continuum field as a solution of this equation. But now, I, if you imagine that you know, underlying to this continuum, there's somewhere some microscopic scale. So you know, I take a microscope and enlarge sort of enormously. Eventually, I will see some microscopic structure, which is sort of you know, indicated here by this simple lattice. And when I look at particles on that scale, then it will be just sort of, you know, it will be statistically, it will be random but it will be in some sort of stationary or, or maybe equilibrium state. I mean, so, so uh, at each point when I do this enlargement, if I sort of go down all the way to the atomistic scale, I will see lots of particles still, but you know, in some sense, they are statistically according to equilibrium and, and, and uh, that's sort of their main structure, okay? So now I want to sort of use this picture uh, uh, for the Torda lattice. And now you see that there's a small problem because the total lattice will have many conserved quantities. I mean, there's an extensive number of conserved quantities. And so the U, you know, must be a vector. It must sort of, you know, give a label for every, every conserved quantity. And, you know, you start with, with number, position, uh, energy, and then higher orders. They all will be governed by such kind of equations. So, so the U, but will be a high dimensional vector. And J of U will be an even more complicated function, which depends on all, you know, for every component will depend on all components. I mean, it's a completely coupled system. And so this is something which we have to sort of understand. Okay, and at the end of the talk, I will hopefully give you sort of, uh, you know, a more concrete description of what kind of equation we get actually for the, for the Toda lattice. Okay, so now we have to sort of put a little bit, uh, think what we have to do. I mean, what is the program for, for the next, uh, 30 minutes or, or, or 45 now, well, let's say 30 minutes or so. Um, you see, we have to sort of, we have to total lattice, so we have to build from the bottom. I mean, we first have to understand what are exactly these, these local stationary states. And uh, then and I put here average, we don't know yet exactly what this average is, but then we have to sort of somehow compute their average. I mean, this will give to you. And then we have to compute also their currents. And then of course we will find, you know, this function J of U. So, so if we somehow understand how to do this, then uh, we should be able to write down the, the hydrodynamic equation. But you see, it's a complicated program because, um, you know, we always have to fight with the fact that the, the conservation laws are extensive and therefore, you know, it cannot work for sort of the simple scalar quantities. Anyway, so let's try to uh, do this. And so you see that, that, um, the next, uh, I don't know, 25 minutes or so, we will essentially talk about the statistical mechanics of the total lattice. So, so there will be uh, no dynamics actually. Uh, I will rather, I will sort of trying to tell you, you know, what, what, what is meant by, by, you know, what I called here so roughly equilibrium. Okay, so what are these random initial conditions which I have to put in order to see an hydrodynamic equation? Now, the first thing what we should do is uh, that uh, if I look at the scattering situation with n particles, you know, they just evaporate. I mean, so this is no hydrodynamics. So for hydrodynamics, it's like a fluid. You know, if I put a fluid in, in vacuum, it will just sort of, uh, you know, uh, will, will sort of expand out to outer space and then will just disperse. 
So in order to have a fluid, I mean, you, you need some container. And so the same thing you do over here. And, and so this is what I call the periodic or the closed chain. And you see that it's just almost like the open. I mean, the only thing is that now I have to go here all the way up to N. And so this means that the particle um, N is still sort of, you know, uh, 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 yeah, I mean, so, so, so uh, okay. Sorry, I, I should say this differently. I mean, so, okay, so there will be a coupling between um, between uh, n and one, but I have to tell you what this coupling actually is. And so here I, I put sort of the complete explanation. So what I have to do is that um, if I imagine that that I have to, that, that these configurations qj given, then you know for the next cell I simply have to add the number of l. I mean, so here maybe in this picture you can see this more easily. So these are let's say three particles over here. And then I produce uh, a periodic configuration by sort of just copying exactly the same three, three particles in the next cell. Okay, so this is actually, I mean, it's exactly what, what was done. Uh, sorry, it was exactly what was done over here. I mean, so here you see the copying simply means that this actually should have been drawn down here. So you can really think of, of these total particles moving on a circle of length L. Okay, so I have done, uh, I have ensured that they sort of cannot escape and uh, you have to do a little bit of thinking, but uh, in fact, this parameter can take in any real value. I mean, it looks like, you know, positive would be enough, but, but that's not the case. But for this, you have to think a little bit. In any case, the main point is you should think of, of, uh, of, of particles moving on a circle and that's sort of sufficient, uh, um, you know, sort of it, it's sort of like the box i mean particles cannot escape to infinity all right so now we have the periodic the closed chain and now the next question is um uh what what are the conserved quantities but before doing this uh it turns out that uh, one has to use sort of slightly different variables which are usually called the flash car variables um, uh, and we formulate, you know, the system in, in coordinates which, which are more convenient. I mean, it, it's really new coordinate system. I mean, it, it, that's, you know, otherwise the motion is just a mechanical motion, but, but it's just sort of different way of writing the equations. And I should mention, I mean, you know, it, it sort of was, it, it was a good year for the total lattice. This was in 74. Before, they had sort of numerical solu solutions which indicated that the total lattice is actually integrable. But the first person who sort of found the, the n minus one conserved quantities was was Henault, but in a form which was sort of you know was sort of a little bit magic. I mean some funny combinatorics and 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 uh, of course eventually he got the right result, but uh, you know it, it looked very special. And and then uh, then Flaschka, who had the advantage of being at the Courant Institute at the time, so so he you know he was sort of familiar with with. Uh, work on, on, on other integrable systems. I mean, and, uh, and, and also uh, this should be Manakov, not Makanov, but Manakov. So he was also at the same time, I mean, he was, of course, you know, sort of isolated. This is in Siberia and um, at Novosibirsk, but, but there they had also, you know, a very strong group in, in dynamical systems. So see, he somehow knew about uh, lax matrix and such kind of things and had also the idea of applying this to the total lattice. In any case, the way how it goes is rather simple. I mean, so you first introduce the uh, positional differences, which is sort of this difference here between QJ and minus QJ. And now, uh, rather than working with, with, uh, the, with the stretches, as I like to call them, uh, you put them up in the exponential. So there's an AJ and then you put here this, uh, this square root, okay? And now you just rewrite your equations of motion in these new variables and you see it looks sort of, uh, you know, less intuitive mechanically, but uh, if you think more algebraically, it, it looks much easier. You have sort of a, a very simple vector field, it's just quadratic, and and uh, this is the particular form, and uh, and and uh, in in these variables, you just have the standard you know periodic boundary conditions. I mean, the a minus one is equal to a n, and the p n plus one is equal to p one. And so here, I have drawn for you what I mean by this lattice field theory. You see, I mean now your phase space is R because uh, that's a which is positive. Uh, sorry, this is the momentum, I mean, which is, can take real values. And then you have the A, which is positive. So it's R plus R, um, R tensor R plus uh, for a single side. I mean, so this is sort of what you see here. These are the sort of the side variables, P1 and A1 up to Pn and An, and of course to the power N because I have N of them. And you see that through the equations, I mean, they simply couple to the, to the, to the two neighbors, I mean, either to the left or to the right. Okay, so this is what I, why I like to call this the lattice field theory. It really sort of like 
you know, what you do, I don't know, if you do quantum spin systems, you know, it would be the same thing. It's just sort of a classical system, but, but you have sort of uh, this variable sitting at size and, and interacting with the neighbors. So what are local conservation laws? Well, one simple conservation law is simply the sum of the stretches. You just have to put this into this equation. It's the log of A, and you see this cancels just this A, and so you see that it's just the sum over the PJs. And so you find that, that um, you know, you have this quantity if you do the sum over all J, uh, because of these periodic boundary conditions will be just zero. So, so, so this is, it just tells you that the total sum of stretches will not change in time. That's a conserved quantity. But it tells you more. This conserved quantity has a density, which is, you know, just living at a single site. So it's it, the density, I mean, this is of course global, but the density is local. It's just living at a single set site. And then if you look at this equation, it's a discrete conservation law. Here you have the time change and here you have the difference. So if I look at, let's say, how, how this stretch is changing in some little, uh, little volume element, you know, because of this telescoping sum, it will just change through the boundaries. And so that's a very important sort of uh, backbone for the hydrodynamics. You want to have conservation laws, but not only you know, quantities which are conserved, but quantities which have a density. That's one thing. The density should be local. And then they will also have a sort of uh, a conservation law, which is, you know, they will have a current which is also local. So, so, so this side is also local. Okay. And from this, you can read off that the field is RJ and the current is simply minus pj. That's just sort of, a, you know, it's just a discrete difference equation here. All right. So now, now, now the question is, how do we get more conservation laws? And this is sort of this uh, beautiful idea of, of uh, these people in, in, the, in the 1974, that uh, you, you can rewrite uh, uh, the equations of motion in terms of what people call a lex pair. So rather than thinking of sort of, you know, this lattice field theory, now you suddenly think about matrices and evolution of matrices. And, uh, uh, you know, they are very concretely given. If I give you one configuration of the P's and A's, I mean, then you form this very particular tri-diagonal matrix. And, uh, you know, because of periodic boundary conditions, you have still the AN sitting up here and up here, okay? And then there's the companion matrix, which sort of looks very similar, but, you know, this is now, uh, this is obviously a symmetric matrix. This is an anti-symmetric matrix, a screw symmetric. And you see that I have an A and minus A here and, and uh, the diagonal is, uh, is zero. And then once you have this idea, then uh, it's very easy to verify, you know, in the ways how I have written it, that uh, uh, for the evolution, so if, uh, you know, the Qs and the Ps evolve according to the total lattice evolution equation, then these matrices will evolve according to the simple commutator type of evolution. And from this, you would deduce immediately that when I look at the eigenvalues of Ln, so here I've written the standard eigenvalue problem for this bidiagonal matrix, then uh, uh, because, uh, you know, the Bn is Q symmetric, you see that the eigenvalues are conserved. You know, I emphasize this so much because it's, it's amazing in the sense that, that uh, I mean, usually would think it's, it's very complicated to find these conserved quantities. I mean, here, of course, it's a little bit hidden because, you know, you have to still find the eigenvalues, but as a structure, it's now very transparent. I mean, you know, I, I write down the LN, I mean, and, uh, and then, then, then I compute the eigenvalue and then I know that it doesn't change in time. Now, Heno, uh, sort of, uh, I mean, he did something slightly different. I mean, he looked at, at uh, anyway, he looked at the characteristic polynomial of the LN and, and at the zeros of this polynomial, but sort of, uh, it's the same thing, but I'm trying to say here is that, um, and he was already concerned about this, that while the eigenvalues are conserved, they are not local, they don't have a density. You know, if I change one of the A's a little bit, I mean, then these eigenvalues will go all over the sort of board, so to speak. I mean, they, they don't have a density, which is sort of well-defined. So we have to do, we have to find a density. And this is of course what Flaska understood immediately. And it's very easy to, con to, to get a density. Namely, what you have to do is you just have to take um, the trace of the nth power of that matrix. Okay, and so, so if you now write out the trace, I mean, then it's uh, because we are here on the lattice, it's j up to one, just sum over the, the diagonal matrix elements of this, of this matrix Ln to the power little l. Now you see this quantity, is the sum over lattice side, and therefore this is a density. The question 
is it also local? And the answer is yes, because LN is a tri-diagonal matrix. I mean, so let me just il illustrate this for the case when I take little n equal to six. So now I look at the sort of, you know, order six uh, conserved field. And uh, you see that, that, you know, this is just a simple random walk with six steps. It has to start at J. I mean, here I put J equals zero, has to end at J equals zero. And then uh, since it's right angle, you know, there are not too many sort of matrix elements which I can have. You know, at each, at each point, I can go either up or down or I can stay constant. And uh, so, yeah, I, I just pick one example. So I go up, I stay constant, go up. But then I have to come here, so I have to go down again, constant, and go down again, right? I mean, so this would be one one possible of of this, uh, you know, of, of of the random box which I can insert. And then, uh, you know, if I read this off, I mean, then then I see the corresponding function is now the a naught square. This comes from this piece, and this piece is the a one square that comes from this little triangle over here. And then I have twice a flat piece which is the p one squared. And so you see that that, that the q six is simply a sum of mononomials of order six. And you know the sum is sort of described by doing a simple uh, random walk uh, expansion of you know sort of multiplying out these matrices. And now we are in shape. I mean, uh, we, we found you know lots of conserved quantities. I can go up to you know n and go up to, to capital N, that's the size of the system. But when I look now at the infinite, so so it will be an extensive number. And if I do the infinite system, then uh, then uh, um, I will have an infinite number of conservation laws. And of course, you know the carbons I can determine. I mean, I'm sort of guaranteed that because of the conservation that there will be such kind of a discrete uh, conservation law. And there are local carbons, and these local carbons you can also express in terms of the Lex matrix. So this is very beautiful, and it, it's sort of in, in in other systems, you know, typically these formulas are much more complicated. And so it's nice. To have a you know fairly concrete and, and simple starting point because then you can do sort of more difficult things later on. Okay, so now now where are we now? Well, I mean we are sort of at the level of trying to explain you why the total lattice is, is an integrable many-body system, right? I mean this is one characteristic, many conservation laws, and we have explicit formulas. Okay, now the next thing what we want to do is we want to do uh, the long time limit. Uh, well, uh, okay, so it's integrable. I mean, so so now now you have to sort of uh, remember that uh, uh, you know in classical mechanics, an integrable system corresponds of fi of fixing the action variables and then having the angles variable sort of moving on the towers. And again, I mean, this is something which so this is what uh, Boltzmann un un understood already that you know if you want to see the long time limits, you better specify you know, what are the conserved quantities. So here we have many of them. And and uh, I mean, this is again, I mean, work of Henrici and Kaplan, I mean, you sort of, you know, analyze this in, in, in great, great detail. And uh, uh, what you do is the following. I mean, you, you, you fix uh, uh, the stretches. I mean, so this is just sort of a given number and you see fix the total momentum. That's another given number. And then uh, uh, the claim is that the remaining phase space, which is in dimension two times N minus one, is foliated into invariant tori. And then on, on each of these invariant tori, you just have sort of you know, motion on the torus with frequencies which almost surely are non-commensurable. I mean, that's because you know you, 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 you can you know enough about your energy, new energy function in the action variables that you can show. And then you're actually sure that you know you will in the long time limit, you will almost surely go to the uniform measure on the tori. Okay, so now we have, uh, you know, a very natural construction of what we would expect, what, what the long time limit is, what we should see. So the claim is that if I go back to the original example, there are 16 particles, and if I would wait long enough, I mean, then what I should see is indeed, you know, uh, the, the uniform measure on, on, uh, on each of these tori that would be uniform measure, okay. Now, I mean, this, this is very nice. And that for, for a while, I thought, you know, one should be able to do more with it, but you get stuck. I mean, it's, it's a nice picture, but if you really want to get more information, I mean, this is not how to proceed. And so now we have to sort of do the statistical mechanics sort of in a slightly more clever way. And, and of course, it would be nice if at some point one could connect it here to this invariant Torah in a, in, a, in a more closer fashion, but uh, I'm not using this at all. So now uh, the next item which one does is uh, one sort of remembers that in statistical mechanics, I mean, you learn something about equivalence of ensembles. 
which basically means that from a microcanonical constraint, I mean, like saying that, you know, the stretches, you know, must satisfy exactly this delta function here. I mean, they must add up exactly to n times L. Um, it, it's sort of more convenient to put these kind of things in the exponential and, uh, uh, you know, which of course, you know, it's very different, but sort of the equivalence of ensembles tells you that, you know, of system of, of very, very large size. I mean, the two measures actually agree. And so, so rather than having this thing, I put this quantity up to the exponential. And now I have another parameter rather than L, I have a parameter which I call P. And P is in fact a, a rather natural parameter physically, it's just the pressure on the system. And so you see that, that um, uh, you know, the pressure is, is positive. So, so, you know, you have the R chase, which is sort of go linearly. And then you have the interaction potential, which is exponential, a decaying exponential. But when I do, you know, give statistical mechanics, both of them are in the exponential. I mean, this, this one, and also uh, the one which comes from the interaction. And so you see altogether, you get a nice stable system. I mean, uh, you know, if I take P positive, which is always assumed, then, um, uh, you know, I get sort of potentials which are increasing both at infinity, plus infinity and minus infinity, and that's a stable situation, okay? So now we have a natural a priori measure, which is this term. And rather than looking at the P's and Q's, I, I re-express this in terms of the P's and A's. I mean, these are the Flaschka variables. And then in terms of the Flaschka variables, I have now, you know, I have my lattice system and there's uh, what people call the a priori measure, which is a product measure and which has a very simple structure. I mean, this, this, the, this one comes from this P here and the two over H A comes just from change of volume element. All right. All right, so, so now, now we have sort of uh, move a little bit sort of into the statistical mechanics. And uh, uh, the next thing is what you learn in statistical mechanics is that, um, you know, you have to give a Gibbs weight or a Boltzmann weight, okay? Now, if you look up your textbooks in statistical mechanics, what you see when you look under the ch chapter on, under, you know, grand canonical equilibrium measures, then what you will see is that you're supposed to put in the exponential simply the linear sum of all the conserved quantities. I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is sort of standard textbook thing. And, and so, uh, of course, usually it's applied to the case where kappa is maybe five or only two or three, depending on the situation. But now we are, have to apply this to many. I mean, so why don't we just take a large sum and to n equal zero up to a very large kappa, maybe eventually kappa going to infinity. And of course, it's an arbitrary linear combination. So in front of every conserved quantity, which is this one, there will be a parameter, which is mu n, and which sort of you know, tells you with what kind of weight, I mean, this, this particular conserved quantity appears in that exponential. So this, this formula is sort of, you know, standard statistical mechanics with the only difference is that we have a large number of um, objects up there appearing in the exponential. Usually you think of e to the minus beta energy, and then uh, there's only one, uh, and then maybe you add a uh, chemical potential for the number of particles, then you have two, or maybe the momentum, then you have five, but, but, but now we have an infinite sort of, ten, by tens, an infinite number of these things. Now, uh, there's a nicer formula to write this, which sort of makes it a little bit more transparent. You see, uh, you know, I can just use the functional calculus for matrices. And I define what I call the confining potential, which has nothing to do with the interaction potential. I can define the confining potential, which is simply this power series, right? I mean, this is W to the power N. I mean, if you think in eigenvalues, you see this is lambda to the little n, so it would be W to the N, and then I do this power series, and this is what is the, the confining potential, right? And that's, of course, independent of the number of particles. The number of particles sits in the little ln over here. So here's an example of such a confining potential. And of course, uh, you know, it has to be bounded from below. It goes up so that um, uh, things are really confining. So, you know, you think of a, a simple example, then you take kappa equal to four, then, uh, you know, this would be sort of like a quadratic and uh, maybe cubic and, and, and quartic term, right? And then, then it looks maybe something like this, okay? And so, you know, after this many words, I have told you what, what, you know, what I said before, what are these stationary states for the total that is? Well, the answer is they are, you know, uh, the Gibbs ensembles. I mean, like for any other good old system from statistical mechanics, but with a special feature that now, you know, this, uh, this uh, Gibbs ensemble, which sometimes is called generalized Gibbs ensemble, depends on two, uh, 
parameter assembly on a scalar, which is the pressure P, which is sitting in this a priori measure here, and on a full function. That's this confining potential, right? You see, I want to keep this confining. You know, I don't, you know, if I wanted to thermal equilibrium, then I would say, okay, let's fix this to the quadratic potential. So this is what I've written here. Then let's fix this to the quadratic potential. And then of course, uh, you know, then I could just do the thermal equilibrium. But this is not what we can do. I mean, we, we have to take all of them. And therefore, you know, I have to understand the full dependence on this full function. So when I look, so here's the normalizing factor. If I compute the free energy, then the free energy will be a functional of this confining potential V. So that makes the problem sort of, you know, unusual and, and also much more difficult because, uh, you know, how, how am I going to, you know, I, if I do the partition function, how am I going to do this integral? I mean, you know, it, it lo looks, looks awful, right? I mean, there's nothing you can do. But there's one thing which, which I would like to point out, which is sort of more conceptual thing and, and which, um, uh, it's actually very useful, and, and, and you will see in a second uh, that this is appearing. If you now go back to the to to the to the Lex matrix, which was this sort of triangle matrix over here, here's the triangle matrix. Now you see that the P's and the A's, all these entries, are actually random quantities because you know they are distributed according to this very particular law here. Right? And so, in fact, what we should think of is this Lex matrix as a random matrix under a given sort of statistical mechanics ensemble, okay? So, uh, so you see before that the Lex matrix was sort of more like a simple way of, of writing the evolution equation and finding the conserved, uh, the conserved fields or the, conserved, the conservation laws. But now, if you think in terms of statistical mechanics, actually sort of slightly different. You see what you, what you should think of is the LN is, is, is a random matrix under GG. And, and uh, if I do this, oops, if I do the thermal case, it's a very particular easy case, namely then, you know, this is just a quadratic case. And then up here, I just get uh, something which is, which is quadratic uh, in, in, in my A's and my P's and therefore, uh, you know, has a rather simple structure. And when you look at this slightly more carefully, what you find is that in the thermal case, the, the diagonal of your, of your tri-diagonal matrix, they are simply IID Gaussian. So these are the PJs. And then when you look at the off diagonal, then you see that they are, they, they are also IID according to a chi distribution. And the chi distribution has this parameter 2P in here, right? So, uh, so thermal equilibrium is particularly easy or simple you know, in structure, because uh, you have a triangle, you have a triangle random matrix with independent entries. But if I go to complicated things like this, I mean, uh, nothing is independent, right? I mean, so it's it's a mess. All right, it's a real Can mess. Ask question. Just make a quick comment. So that should be equivalent to the uniform measure on the invariant torus. Correct. I mean, this is what, what what I want to say. I mean, this would be a nice nice thing actually if if somebody could show, I, I, I don't know how difficult it is, but but uh, yes, I mean, you're totally right. I mean, what should be happening is that this measure, um, so if I take the uniform measure on uh, with a certain distribution for the for the action, yeah, if I take the uniform measure on the Torah, and then if I make the system large, then uh, it should it should converge to, 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 to one of those guys. No, but yeah. we don't have as nice a description of these invariant tori in terms of yeah. the lax matrix. That, that's that's uh, it, it's a very good point. I mean, yeah, I was looking at this also in context in the context of, of other models. Um, uh, uh, usually, the tori these tori are at least to me. I mean, maybe maybe people who sort of understand this see better. To me, they look, I mean, of course, you know, you are sure that there are these tori, but but they look. I mean, you know, these are, you know, the coordinate transformation between the pinny piece and plus into the toys is something which is rather complicated. And then so, so I don't really, I, I've never succeeded to work directly with the toy. Right? Okay. Herbert, Herbert, this yes, is yes. Stefano. This is Stefano. I have a question. Do you ah, have, Stefano, uh, good, yes. <laughs> there is any decay of correlation uh, oh, in this measure? Okay. Or? okay. Good question. Yeah, or, no, or, I, a, or a choice of mu n for such that there is a decay of correlation or something in okay, mixing. So, so if I if I take kappa finite, then uh, in my paper I claim that that uh, you know then you can use transform matrix computation because then your interaction is finite range. 
right? And that's this random walk picture. If I take, you know, kappa equal to six, I mean, then, you know, you, you have an interaction which goes only over six lattice sites. And there, I mean, my claim is, I mean, I haven't really worked out all the details. My claim is that, that in this case, I mean, you can do a transfer matrix and, and the measures, uh, you know, should have nice exponential correlations. I mean, should be exponentially mixing. And presumably it's true for a much larger class of V. But, but, but even my proof, I would say, you know, I have never really written out every, every detail in, in completeness. And uh, I think it's an interesting open question to prove, um, I mean, the real theorem which you would like to prove under, you know, reasonable assumptions on V, I mean, maybe a little bit of smoothness and, and you know, the semi-boundedness and increase at infinity, the corresponding masses should have, uh, should be exponential mixing. But this, this is this is really a uh, homework. I mean, it's I, I don't know I, I don't know how to do that in, in such, such a generality. Answers your question or? No. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Okay, good. Okay, so now 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 let me first say what we what we actually know here. Um, uh, well, I mean, here I put this already. Okay, so so I put it as a claim, but but but, but I think it really requires sort of you know actually really working out sort of more details, but what I want to show you is you can do the free energy. And you see, now we understood that, 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 the, the, that the lax matrix is actually a random matrix. You know, one of the central quantities of a random matrix is that you want to compute the density of states. I mean, so here I put what people call the empirical density of states. I mean, because it's sort of defined for every, uh, every particular sort of sample of, of eigenvalues. And this is sort of, you know, the sum over the delta functions divided by one over n. And then that empirical, that's of course a random quantity because the lambdas are quantum, but the assertion is that almost surely it will, will go to a, to, to a limit. I mean, here there, there's more mathematics on that actually, but I mean, let me not go into this, but, but one of the central quantities for the hydrodynamics is actually this, this density of states. So that, that, that's a very crucial thing. And so, so, so this is sort of, a, you know, something which comes up very naturally when you look at this relaxed matrix. And once I have this density of states, then of course I can compute what I wanted to do, namely I can compute um, uh, this, uh, the, the, the average value of the conserved fields. I mean, you know, these are supposed to be average values with respect to the Gibbs measure. I use the fact that, uh, you know, it's translation invariant. So this is just the density. So I can look at, you know, uh, the conserved the density at lattice point one, and then I do the average with respect to the GGE. And then, of course, by this whole construction, it will be just the nth moment of of um, uh, of, the, of the asymptotic density of states. So, so this is a law of large numbers. I mean, there's also a central limit theorem. You see, it's a function, and and uh, of course, you know, if I look at the next order correction, then it will fluctuate a little bit, and and will have Gaussian fluctuations. I mean, this is something which one can study. And in fact, one of uh, sort of at least to me. Big discovery, sort of like uh, now, it's sort of like 10, 10 months ago, was that that uh, um, uh, when you look at the average carbons, they are actually related to to to, to such central limit theorems. But uh, I cannot go into this; this would go too far away. Okay, so this is what I want to do, and and now I want to give you one slide, which sort of maybe sort of a little bit technical, but but still I would like to show you, sort of convince you why why one can actually you know I put here you know, okay, okay, I mean, why, why, how can I do that, okay? Uh, because, you know, the original formula was, was really pretty bad. And so, so let me just tell you something about the free energy and the rest I sort of skip, right? Okay. So now how to do the free energy and then uh, something happened, which, which uh, at least uh, happens rarely, namely that you can uh, suddenly can rely on, on, on previous literature, you know, which we're trying to do, do something totally different, but nevertheless, I mean, you can use result. And so let me explain you uh, a little bit about what Dumitrio and Edelman tried to do in, in 2002. And, and they were looking at, at uh, so-called beta ensembles. I mean, so let's say they were looking of an N by N matrix and you put all the uh, symmetric and you put all the matrix IID Gaussians. I mean, so this is, let's say a, a typical example which you want to do, okay? Now, um, what they were asking is these, these are people sort of coming a little bit more from, from sort of numerical analysis idea. What they were asking is, can I somehow make sure that, uh, okay, can, I, can I sort of unitarily transform such a random matrix that uh, it becomes wider angle? And if so, what would be the statistics of these wider angle matrices, which are induced by, you know, having all 
matrix elements sort of independent Gaussians. And they said, yes, we can do it. And, uh, and uh, they give a, gave a construction in their paper. And um, um, when, you, when you look at, at, at their construction, then uh, what you see is that they prove sort of an interesting identity. So they look, look again, you know, this looks sort of essentially like our old Lex matrix. You know, I just put those two matrices I sort of put equal to zero. It doesn't make any difference for what I'm at doing here. So it's just, just like the Lex matrix, I, I call them B, which, uh, you know, that, that sort of to distinguish, you know, think it's sort of more like a more abstract mathematical argument. And, and, and what they said is the following that if I now look at this particular partition function, I mean, Okay, uh, so they never looked at this thing. I mean, but 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 in spirit, they, they looked at uh, they looked at quadratic functions here. But uh, uh, okay, anyway, so so you can look at this this general function, and what they tell you is um, uh, how this matrix element sort of can be rewritten, and in fact, they give get this particular identity. Okay, so so basically, you know, this one appears down here. Basically, what you see, what you should say is that you know they get sort of a formula for the Jacobian of going from this thing uh, to, to the eigenvalues. So the lambdas are still the eigenvalues of this particular matrix, right? I mean, that, that, that's always a big step. I mean, you, you know, you, 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 the natural coordinates are, so to speak, the A and Bs, and now you want to somehow know something info about, information about the eigenvalues. And if you succeed to do, you know, see what, 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 uh, what, uh, what the Jacobian of this transformation is, then, then of course, you, you know, that's a big step forward. And so this is what they tell you. And uh, they pick up, uh, so to speak, this fundamental determinant, which is sort of here written in the exponential. And so they find actually uh, an interaction, which is very, very well known in, in sort of particular corners of statistical mechanics, which is sort of called one dimensional log S. I mean, you see the lambdas are sort of like position of, of point particles, but they have this very funny logarithmic interaction, which is sort of very long range. And, uh, and uh, so it has uh, sort of very unusual properties compared to short range interactions. So that's an absolutely amazing identity, right? I mean, you, you, you go from, from such kind of a matrix to uh, sort of a description which, which uh, you know. And then the, the main point about this formula is that the beta which appears here is at that stage completely arbitrary. Originally, they did, did, did this uh, transformation for beta equal to two, but once they had the algebra, they realized that you know they can take any beta. So when you go back to the Dimitri Edelman paper, of course, they state this result for any beta. Okay, so you're done. Okay, 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 we're done. I mean, so, but no, we are not done because, you know, I, I encircled this little thing over here and that's sort of very unfortunate. You see, for the, for the Toda lattice, this was P. There's a constant pressure sitting here. There is the Dumitri Edelman, they have P times J. I mean, there's just nothing to do. If you want to have this identity, you must have a linear change in pressure. Okay. This is that, that that's their formula. Okay, so and when I saw it, I said, Ah, you know, uh, too bad. I mean, what can I do? Uh, and and the, for a while, it was sort of a complete riddle. But now remember that I can take the beta completely arbitrary. So, uh, so why not choosing beta equal two p over n? Now, why do I take two p over n? Well, you see, if this means that that, that this pressure is changing slowly, it has a slope one over n. And so, you know, I have a large system, but every little piece, because it's sort of, you know, slowly, I mean, it has a slope one over n, every little piece sort of looks like a homogeneous system. And therefore, with this very particular choice, I finally get what is the, what is the free energy of the total lattice, namely, I have to compute this free energy, which is something which, which I know how to do, or that people tell me how to do that. And then uh, I basically have to sort of some, you know, uh, all these different slopes, uh, all the different uh, piece here, and then uh, I get actually the, the 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 total free energy. Okay, all right. So let let let's uh, do this in a slightly. Uh, I have to look at my watch. Okay, so so still I want to show you this one thing here. So um, so now now we 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 can do the to do the log gas. I mean this is sort of how you deal with this logarithm. Maybe I should go back and so 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 you know I'm looking now at this problem here. But now there's a sitting one over n here, and that, that's of course something which is very well understood. This so-called mean field limit in statistical mechanics, and you know that the free energy is given by this very particular free energy function, which is not so surprising. This is just a, the entropy term. This was this confining potential, which is linear, and this is sort of this logarithmic interaction. Okay, and then what you find is that there's a unique minimizer, 
And uh, if you want to compute the total free energy, I mean, then uh, you know the, the, you, you you have to evaluate this mean field free energy at the minimizer. But then now remember that that we, we uh, remember that we, we still have we still have this integral. So this means that I have to differentiate in p, and what I get is then this particular formula for the free energy. Okay, but what is more important is that you know we want to free energy is fine, but we want to have the, the density of states. But now. You know, the, the density of states is just taking derivatives of the free first order derivatives of the, the free energy. And so you will find a nice explicit formula for this uh, density of states, provided, you know, you can find the minimizer. That, that's now a, sort of a separate issue, but, you know, it's a, it's a very nice and close ex expression. You can look at the corresponding Euler Lacrange equation. You maybe can solve them numerically, I mean, depending what you want to do. I mean, the main point is that now you have sort of a real close formula which you can work with. Okay, so I guess I'm running out of time. So so let me not go to this particular case, but let me come to the last um, uh, uh, sort of uh, slide here. Um, uh, so so now I, you know, I was always claiming I can say something about hydrodynamic equations. Okay, so 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 this is what I want to do. Now, of course, now there are huge gaps, and then the, the, I will not even try to 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 close them up. But but I want to sort of explain you what is what is the picture and, and 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 what is the structure of the mathematical equation which i get okay so let, let, let let's go first to the picture so what i plotted here is space time and i should imagine that at time t equals zero i put here some random initial state but it is slowly varying in x i mean so when i look at the little little uh, interval over here then i will see one particular set of parameters right i mean so remember that that the parameters for the gge is the average stretch, so this is called new here, and it's the local density of states of the lax matrix. So if you think of, of, of these particles, you know, they are total mass, but when I look locally and I, let's say a thousand particles and I do, do the, do the lax matrix, then the density of states is something which of that lax matrix is something which is slowly varying, not the individual eigenvalues, but, but, but the density of the eigenvalues. And so, so what I put here, I'm, I'm simply assuming that, that you know, uh, these parameters, I mean, the new and the density and the lax density of state is sort of slowly varying. Okay, and now the claim is that when I look on the Euler scale, um, you know, the picture will simply repeat uh, in the sense that when I now look at some space-time patch, which is called here xt, so this is xt, and now I look at this, uh, this patch, and now I enlarge in such a way that I really see my underlying uh, uh, lattice, then the assertion is that uh, if I correctly update the, the new, the stretch, and the, the lax density of states, I mean, then uh, I will see again, sort of, uh, on, uh, I will see again uh, a generalized Gibbs ensemble. Okay, so that, that's the picture which is behind it. And the hydrodynamic equations tells you how I should update, uh, you know, these parameters starting with the parameters given by my initial state. And now I'm just writing down for you the equation. I mean, so so in this case, I've written it because I have sort of uh, a scalar and the functions are written in this way. There are other ways of writing it, but but I mean, I just wrote it like this. So so here's the first equation, which of course is uh, sort of um, just momentum conservation. So, so the, uh, the stretch conservation. So this is sort of easy, right? I mean, so that's uh, new and it's, it's just evolving according. So the current is just uh, the first moment of, of, of the density of states. So, so, so that's easy. Now comes a more complicated, equation which is sort of tells you how uh, the density of states is evolving in time and it's evolving in time according to this equation. So, you know, you don't have to look at, at the specific things, which I want to emphasize is that, uh, that, that this V effective, which is sort of here not at all explained, is actually a functional of nu and, and rho q. It's a functional of the stretch and of the density of states. Okay. Now, uh, I want. I just want to con convince you that it's a function. I mean, you know, you should see on one side that you know it's a function, which it's not totally trivial. I mean, you know, it's just sort of some really simple function, but nevertheless, it's sufficiently concrete that you can sort of uh, do computations and then can compare, you know, with with uh, molecular dynamic simulation of the total lattice, etc. And so, so, so this is the last thing which I want to do, namely. I want to tell you what, you know, how, how is this function constructed? And so I think one particular way, there are different ways, and this is just one single way so that you get some impression. So first what I do is I, I take my, my famous um, 
uh, two particle scattering shift. So, so this is this logarithm, right? I mean, uh, and you see that the logarithm I didn't emphasize is suddenly, you know, so this fundamental determinant appears also in the free energy. It's not only in the dynamics, but it's also in the free energy. Anyway, so I make a, a linear operator out of this by, by taking the logarithm as, as the kernel of this integral operator, right? Okay, so this is fine. And now uh, in terms of the row Q, which I imagine to be given here, I construct another function, which I call rho mu. Okay, so, so it, it's just a ratio, yeah, it's just a simple ratio, just a rho Q, and then I act with this operator on rho Q, and then here I have the new, and, and then, then I get this new function. So that, this is a very simple operation, so to speak, okay? Okay, now, now I have to tell you what, what, what this whole mess is. One over new be effective in rho Q. So, so this is what I've written here, okay? And now the assertion is that I first take a linear function. That's my linear function. And now I act with a symmetric operator on this. So rho mu here in this formula is, is considered as a multiplication operator. So, so this is, and this is this integral operator here. So, and here's the multiplication. So you see that this actually all together is a symmetric operator which is, uh, you know, reasonably explicit, but, but you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's little, still somewhat complicated. And then I, all what I have to do is act on the linear function, which gives me some new function. And it's this new function, which I have to plug into the equation, right? And so, so this tells you in what sense this quantity is a local, I mean, you know, local in X and T functional of new and rho Q. And uh, when you do numerics, then uh, actually you, you go to a slightly different form of this equation, which involves this function of rho mu, which has the advantage that you can sort of, you know, up this, update this more easily. Anyway, so, so uh, my time is up, uh, definitely up. And then so, so just two words of, of outlook. Um, well, there, there are, of course, integrable many body systems, quantum many body systems on which there's huge amount of work. I recommend, I mean, it's a very nice lectures by, by Benjamin. I mean, so if you want to get some, good impression of what's going on. I mean, this, this would be sort of, you know, the first starting point. I just put on the archive another uh, sort of uh, somewhat more lengthy uh, type of manuscript, which, which focuses uh, exclusively. I mean, Benjamin also has Toda, but, but yes, also many other things. And I just exclusively sort of concentrate on Toda. Okay. The other thing which I wanted to mention is that um, um, uh, one, one has, um, uh, uh, the, the Euler type equations which you get, I mean, for this various class of systems, which sort of first, you know, look very different. Once you're on that large scale, they always have exactly the same structure. And essentially the essential difference between the various models always lies in the two particle scattering shift. And the two particle scattering shift is really something, you know, it's just two particles. I mean, it's just something which is, you know, once you know you have an integrable model, it, it, it's very explicit. And so, so that, that to me is still, I mean, you know, of course, I give these talks and, and I say it, but it's still surprising to me is that, you know, this, this sort of rather different looking models at the end on the hydrodynamic scale. I mean, they have sort of a, the very, very sort of, you know, really a common structure and, 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 and uh, you know, all, all these fine details sort of somehow have disappeared. It, 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 it's uh, just the type of equations which I wrote down you in the previous slide. And maybe another thing which I should mention, I mean, you know, when you think about Euler, maybe you want to do, sort of Navier-Stokes correction. And uh, uh, this is something which is understood, at least sort of, you know, on the theoretical physics level. And uh, if you want to know more about this, I mean, there's a, a paper by these two gentlemen who sort of investigate what would be the next order correction to the, to the Euler scale, which I discussed. So anyway, thank you very much for listening. So I suggest uh, let's unmute ourselves and thank the speaker for a great talk. Are there any questions? Okay. May I ask a question? Yes, please do, yeah. Um, Herbert, uh, you, you used periodic boundary conditions here, or uh, you, or it was some uh, directly at the end, so I, I, I could not recall. Is it Was it periodic or? Periodic, yes, it's on the circle. Ah, it's if, on the you circle. Of, if you think. Uh, in terms of uh -huh. particles, they are just part of moving on the circle, and and uh, and the length and, and the length of the circle is sort of one parameter right in, in my model, so to speak. Uh -huh. Yeah. But uh, so, do you expect anything? Or, I mean, essentially different if you just confine it to a box, or? Ah, that's a good question. Well, you see, um, okay. Now, first of all, if I confine it to a box, I mean, you know, it's an integrable system. If I just confine it to a box. 
then uh, you break integrability. Mm -hmm. Everything, everything has disappeared, right? Okay, so uh, okay, so wait a second, wait a second. The okay. second answer to your question is that, uh, so so, this is to tell you that that um, you know we are sort of in a lucky situation that when I do this this uh, you know if I put this in a in a on the circle, you know this particular operation does not uh, destroy integrability. I mean that that sort of. Uh, that's special for the total lattice. It's not, not true in general. Anyway, you could ask yourself, if I now go to the hydrodynamic scale and now put it in the box, what do I see? Yes. Right? Now this of course requires some investigation, but of course there uh, you could hope that um, um, if let's say you just think in terms of spectral reflection, you, you might hope that you could figure out um, what what are exactly you know the, the, the boundary conditions which I have to feed into the into the hydrodynamic equation in order to describe this situation. I don't think it has been done for that particular case. I mean, Benjamin looked at cases where you have sort of like, like um, an external slowly varying potential, which of course also uh, breaks integrability immediately, but, uh, but there you can argue that on the hydrodynamic scale, I mean, you can add in this potential in a particular way. And then on the hydrodynamic scale, you can still deal with, with uh, potentials which are varying on the hydrodynamic scale. Okay, yeah. okay. okay I see. Thank you. So in the principle, uh, periodicity is crucial because it preserves integrability and this is very special boundary. Yeah, that, that's very special, yeah. But physically, we do not expect that it should be that relevant. Well, it uh, it, it's hard to say, right? I mean, you know, we are, we are the, the, I mean, you know, if I, if I break integrability too much, I mean, then, then yes. it's just gone, right? I mean, so yes. no, no, I think you have to look at, at, at uh, the, the, I, I don't think you can make so easily global statements. I mean, you have to look at specific cases, right? Yeah, okay, thank you. I guess there, is, uh, there will be some non-trivial uh, integrability bo uh, breaking in boundary terms in the equation, and, and it's not clear how to describe that, right? So the boundary term 